All right. Good morning, everybody. Chapter 17 today, Oligopoly. This is our fourth and final market structure that we're learning. Um, quick review of the market structures we've learned so far. At the very top is perfect competition. OK. And then if I rank them according to market power, Monopoly is down here. They have full market power, meaning the ability to change the price. So we have perfect competition up here. Uh, no ability to change the price. We call them price takers. All the way down here to Monopoly, they have full ability to change the price. We call them price makers. You can say that they have market power. And then in the middle are these two pieces with imperfect competition. The first we learned about last chapter, monopolistic competition, right? So we have many sellers, slightly different products, OK? And now here we have oligopoly. And this is just a few sellers. So if you can imagine a world in, with a monopoly world, and then you add in two more guys, and you have three total, that's oligopoly. OK? That's basically what we're thinking about, OK? And so the um, kind, what we're going to ask in each of these is, right? what's the profit maximizing price and quantity? How do we maximize profits? And then, is this good for society or not? That's the general question that we're asking for each of them. Perfect competition is easy. Since they can't set the price, they just, they just do a profit maximizing quantity. They don't even need to do a profit maximizing price, right? So they just do a quantity. And we know this is the best for society, right? The, it's, it's, the welfare is the highest, meaning there's the highest amount of total surplus, consumer surplus plus producers, producer surplus, right? Down here, we have much lower quantity, much higher price at the profit maximizing point, and it's much worse for society. And uh, these are also ranked in like how, how the welfare affects for society, right? So oligopoly is slightly better than monopoly. And it makes sense. If you add in a couple more guys to compete with the monopolist, right, the prices are going to come down a little bit, and they'll sell a couple more. If you bring in even more, and they sell maybe differentiated products, that is quite a lot better. Um, remember, there's still a little bit of problem with monopolistic competition we learned about. Namely, they don't sell the, the quantity, the total amount of quantity that, they, that we would want. And they still charge you slightly more than marginal cost. We call that markup over marginal cost. Um, and then finally, with the perfect competition, it's like the best for society. We, price equals marginal cost. The quantity equals the socially optimal quantity. And everybody is totally, totally happy. So we always compare all of these other ones. We compare them back to perfect competition to see how much better or worse they are. Um, don't forget, the overall profit maximizing rule, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's for all market structures. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. OK? All right, so let's get started. Let's ask, ask and answer these questions. So what outcomes are possible under oligopoly? Right? What P and what Q are we going to see? Um, why is it difficult for oligopoly firms to cooperate? So um, if you imagine the monopoly scenario and then two or three guys come in and like they're going to compete and have competition, that's what generally happens. Even if they try to all get together, all the oligopoly firms, and say, hey, let's try to still act like a monopolist and raise our prices super high, generally doesn't end up happening. They generally have competition for each other. So we're going to explain why they can't cooperate, and they mostly just uh, compete with each other. Uh, we're going to talk about antitrust laws, basically breaking up monopolists into oligopolists and breaking up oligopolists into even smaller firms. We call those perfect competition firms. Those are antitrust laws. Um, and we're also going to look at, kind of think about how that makes society better off, OK, by, by breaking up these bigger companies. OK, so first thing we need to think about is measuring market concentration. Now, why market concentration? Well, it's, it's easy to tell when a firm is in a perfect competition world, right? It's just like there's a bunch of little small firms that are all selling the exact same product. It's easy to, kind of easy to tell when a firm is in a monopolistic competition world, right? There's a bunch of little small firms, and they're selling slightly different products. It's really easy to tell when a firm is in the monopoly world because it's just the only firm, OK? So how do you tell if a firm is an oligopolist, right? OK, 
So remember, this comes from oligos, which means just a few, and then pol poli, which is sellers. So just a few sellers. We're literally talking three or four or five sellers here, OK? So basically, what we have to do is look and see how many sellers are there in the whole marketplace, OK? And we call that market concentration, OK? So the concentration ratio is the percentage of the market's total output supplied by its four largest firms. OK, that's the definition of a concentration ratio. And the reason we use concentration ratios is to check if it's an oligopoly or not. Um, so it, this number can go from 0 to 1, or 0% to 100%. The higher is the concentration ratio, the less competition there is. OK. And so oligopolists always have very high concentration ratios. So if you look at an industry and you see a high concentration ratio, you know it's either oligopoly or monopoly. right? And monopoly is easy to check off. You're like, well, is there more than one firm? OK, it's not monopoly. It must be oligopoly. OK. Um, I just wanted you to, to kind of think this through here. What's the concentration ratio? So we're going to. Divide up all of the sales. Let's say this is cell phone sales. OK. Now, with cell phones, what kind of market structure is that? Is that perfect competition? Are there a million different cell phone providers? No. There's like pretty much what? Four? Four main ones? ATT, Sprint. Um, T-Mobile, Verizon, right? So if we were to like divide up all cell phone sales into this kind of pie chart, we'd probably have like, I don't know, T-Mobile, Sprint. I think Verizon is the biggest. Um, what was the other one I said? ATT. Okay, AT&T is probably a little bit bigger. But then there might be like a bunch of little ones like Boost Mobile. Or you know some prepaid stuff, All right? Cricket, very good. Okay, so th these and these guys are really small, right? But if we looked at the total percentage of all of the sales of just the four biggest guys, we're looking at this piece of the pie right here, right? That's like what is that? Maybe seventy percent? What I drew right here, right? That's like taking up seven tenths of the pie or seventy percent. So we might say, you know, concentration ratio. I'm making this number up. It might not be true. I think I have uh, more accurate data on the next slide. But let's say 70%. So that's pretty darn high. And so we're going to say, I think, I'm going to think of the cell phone world as an oligopoly. OK? Now, let's imagine that we do this for like, a different, um, a different firm. Let's see here. Uh, so this this is this is maybe oligopoly. Let's do it for something else, not cell phones. Let's do it for electricity providers. How many people can you shop to buy electricity from? Only one. Whatever the electrical provider is, right? So there's, there's only one, and I guess we don't even need to divide this up. We'll just go, you know, the electric company, <laughs> right? So when there's only one firm, that's called a monopoly, and what's the concentration ratio? What's the percentage that the biggest firms have of the total sales? They have 100%, right? So the concentration ratio is 100%. So if you see really, really, really high concentration ratio is like 100%, it's probably a monopoly. Okay. Now, let's imagine one other uh, firm. Let's see. Uh, I don't know. Hamburgers. With all the possible places you could buy hamburgers from, there's probably a ton, right? 
And so if we were to divide up the share of all of the little tiny hamburger sellers, not only is there like the big ones like Burger King and Jack in the Box and McDonald's and I don't know, Wendy's and Arby's and all of those things, right? There's also a bunch of little tiny small ones. There's like small store-bought hamburgers you could buy, right? Stuff like that. You can go to a, like a nice Slater's 50-50 or you know, one of those nice burger chains, something like that. So if you look at the, the, the con concentration ratio of the four biggest firms, oh, that's only one, two, three, four. It's this amount right here that we're talking about. And so we might have a concentration ratio of 10%, something like that. Maybe even lower than that, OK, of the four biggest firms. So when the concentration is really low like this, that's indicative of like perfect competition. Right? This is starting to kind of look like perfect competition. Does that make sense? Because there's a bunch of little firms. OK, so the concentration ratio is actually really, really helpful. It just tells you how big the four biggest firms are. Okay. So that's basically what we're measuring. Let's look at some concentration ratios in, in real life. Video game consoles, right? 100% concentration ratio. Right? Who makes video game consoles? Well, we've got the Microsoft Xbox. We've got the Sony PlayStation. We've got the Nintendo Wii or whatever that thing is called. And I mean, that's probably about it, right? So what's the percentage of sales of the four biggest firms? Well, there's only three firms, actually, right? So the four biggest firms have 100% of the sales, right? Um, it's not a monopoly because there's more than one firm, but it's got an extremely high concentration ratio. So I'm thinking oligopoly. That's what I'm thinking here, OK? Tennis balls. Who makes tennis balls? I think only Wilson and Penn are like the two brand names, right? So what's the percentage of the sales of the four biggest firms? Well, since there's only two, <laughs> they have 100% of the sales, pretty much, right? Credit cards. Super high concentration ratio, right? What are the firms that are credit cards? What, Visa, MasterCard, American Express. Those are probably the three biggest. Maybe Discover might be a fourth biggest one, right? Those four biggest ones, what are the sales? What percentage of the market do they have for credit cards? 99%, right? The other 1% is the little tiny credit cards, like Diners Club or you know whatever the other, the other brands there are, OK? Batteries. We know the most batteries are sold by Duracell and Energizer. Very high concentration ratio, oligopoly. Soft drinks. Most soft drinks, Coca-Cola company or Pepsi company, right? So the, the four biggest firms, I don't even know the number three and number four firms in the soft drink industry, but they sell most of the, yeah, maybe, maybe that Shasta stuff that you buy at Walmart or something, right? Uh, web search engines, mostly Microsoft, Bing, Yahoo Search, Google Search, right? Um, and so all of these, you see cell phone service is actually quite high concentration ratio also, just like I was, I was saying. So we think of all of these as oligopolies because they have high concentration ratios, meaning the four biggest firms sell most of the products in the entire marketplace. Okay? So when we're thinking oligopoly, we're literally thinking two, three, four, five firms maximum in the marketplace. So once again, a market structure in which only a few sellers offer similar or identical products. So it's basically the monopoly world, you add two or three sell more sellers that are selling the exact same thing. Okay? So there's not quite enough competition to make it perfect competition, right? Um, because perfect competition, you might have a million more sellers coming in if they're making profit, right? So some, for some reason in oligopoly, there's some sort of hurdle or some sort of barrier to entry that's keeping everybody from entering. So there's not like 500 firms. If there was 500 firms, we would think of it as perfect competition. Okay. And this is the fascinating piece of oligopoly, and also the thing that makes this chapter the hardest, is there's this thing called strategic behavior in oligopoly. Now, for the first time, how much I make how much quantity I make is now dependent on how much quantity you make, the other firm makes. Okay? In, oh, I don't have them listed here, but in perfect competition, the thing that was listed at the top, all I did to determine my quantity, price equals marginal cost, boom. Wherever those two curves cross, I produce that quantity, right? In, in Monopoly, 
I just set the marginal revenue curve equal to the marginal cost curve, boom, I've got a quantity. Okay? But for the first time, and, and they didn't care about what the other firms did. They just cared about their own selves. For the first time that it, oligopoly, I care about what you make, however many Q you make, is going to influence the amount of Q that I make. Okay? And we'll, we'll consider these reactions when making decisions. We call that strategic behavior. Strategic behavior is when I care about what other people do when I'm making my decision. Okay? We did not see strategic behavior in any other marketplaces. Right? And the reason why is, imagine there's only two sellers of a product. Okay? I know that between me and you, we have to split the marketplace. We have to split the number of buyers. Okay? So however many you take determines how many buyers are left over for me to, for, to, to take. Okay? And when we analyze these strategic behaviors, we call it game theory. Okay? Game theory. It's, it's the branch. It's actually not even, didn't even start with economics, but we have adopted it in economics to use to study what are people going to do when this guy is looking at this guy and this guy is looking at this guy and then they decide how much to sell and at what price. That's called game theory. Okay, so let's do this example. Let's do a cell phone duopoly in a place called small town, right? Why only a duopoly? Duos, that means two, right? Why only a, 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 a duopoly? Because uh, every model in this class is as simple as possible, right? So what's the most simple oligopoly we can possibly have? Two sellers. So we'll do that, okay? So we have the town has 140 people in it. Okay, 140 people. They all they all want to buy cell phones. Okay, and what they're selling is they're selling a cell phone. And just to make it super simple, it's just like imagine you just buy a cell phone and you get unlimited minutes. You don't have to like select different rate plans. Okay, and this is just trying to make this the most simple, uh, the most simple model possible. So you just go to the place. You can go to the one of the two stores and just buy a cell phone. You just pay one time, unlimited minutes. Okay. So let's look at the demand schedule. This is, so this is the demand, uh, demand schedule. We have when price is $0, when the cell phone is free, everybody wants one. right? When the cell phone costs $5, 130 people want one, all the way up here. When the cell phone costs $45, only 50 people want it. So their preferences are obeying the law of demand. right? As price goes up, quantity goes down. Okay, And let's say that there's only two firms. We'll say T-Mobile and Verizon. In real life, we know there's more cell phone companies, but we're trying to make this model as simple as possible. We just got two guys, and they're selling one thing, a cell phone. All right. So clearly, this little setup, this is not perfect competition, right? Because perfect competition has a bunch of small firms. This is clearly not monopoly, because we have two firms, right? So it's a duopoly. OK. And uh, finally, since we always have to, oops, it's not here anymore, but we always have to think about the thing that was here. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Right? Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So I'm going to need to determine what my marginal cost is. So for each firm, they have no fixed cost, and it costs the firm to sell you a cell phone, it costs the firm $10. It's, it's constant. It's very nice. So this is one of those examples of not an increasing marginal cost curve. Right? Normally, the marginal cost curve kind of swooshes up. This one would just be a flat line at $10 all the way across. Okay? So it always costs them $10 to sell the phone. Okay. Let me ask you a, a question. Well, first, let's do this. Let's calculate the revenue that they make from each at each point. If they charge $0, they're going to sell 140 phones. But how much revenue do they make? Zero. Right? If they sell for five dollars, they're going to sell 130 phones. Five times 130, 650, right? So we have increasing revenue up until this point, right? And then we have decreasing revenue. So if the firms were not interested in profit and they were just interested in revenue for some reason, like getting the maximum amount of cash from the consumers, they would sell at this point, right? They'd sell them for 35 dollars and they'd sell 70 something. This is not what firms are interested in. Right? This is known as the revenue maximizing point. But firms don't revenue maximize. They profit maximize. Obviously, they want to make more profit. So we have to consider the cost as well in order to determine uh, profit. 
Okay. So remember, how much does it cost the firm per cell phone? Ten bucks. Remember, the firm it costs them ten bucks to just produce the cell phone and then to sell it. Okay. So if they sell 140 cell phones, how much is it going to cost them? Fourteen hundred dollars, right? 140 times ten. 130 times 10, 120 times 10, and we have this, this cost scale right here, right? Uh, in order to find the profit then, how do I calculate profits? Revenues minus cost, and that's profits. Let's do that. That's simple. Boom. So they're at negative 1,400 here. Their profit climbs, 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 climbs up to here. That's the maximum profit point. You see that? And then the profit starts going back down. Okay. So let me ask you a question. This whole table, I, I, I drew this table. I haven't even thought about how many firms there are yet, right? This could be, this table would work whether you have one cell phone seller, two cell phone sellers, or 100 cell phone sellers. Because this is just the information from the, the buyers, right? And then the information from the costs. It doesn't, I don't care about how many firms there are. So let me ask you a question. Whoops. What if I turned this marketplace into perfect competition, meaning I allowed 500 cell phone sellers to come in? OK, 500 cell phone sellers to come in. What is, how much is, the, is it going to cost? How much are they going to sell the cell phone for? And how many cell phones are there going to be Okay, in the long run? Perfect competition. Which one of the, which row are we going to be at for perfect competition? Any ideas? Let's think about perfect competition here. Give me some of the characteristics of perfect competition. No profit. <laughs> yes, that's a big one, right? No profit in the long run. Also, so that kind of helps you out here, <laughs> right? Uh, also, what do they set equal to each other? I know that they set marginal revenue equals marginal cost, but they have a special version of that. What do they set, what do they set equal to each other? Do you remember? Price equals marginal cost, OK? And of course, you know, there's lots of sellers. So using this information, pretending that Put on hold that there's only Verizon and T-Mobile. Put that on hold for a second. We're going to pretend we allowed it to be perfect competition. So there's 500 cell phone sellers. Okay. What row are they going to be at? Well, they're going to be at the row where there's no profit in the long run. So look, which row are we at? That one. Okay. Right here. We also want to double check and make sure, is this the row where price is equal to the marginal cost of a uh, marginal cost? Well, price is equal to 10 here. What was the marginal cost per cell phone? 10, right? So I'm going to go ahead and label this row the perfect competition outcome, the competitive outcome. All right. So we've got price is equal to marginal cost. It's all equal to $10. There's 120 cell phones being sold, and there's zero profit. So because it is the competitive outcome, I know that this row is the absolute best that I can do for society. I cannot make society any happier by lowering the price or raising the price or changing the quantity because this is the competitive outcome. Right? It's the absolute best for the welfare of my society. OK, uh, so remember this row. Remembered, OK? Now I want to uh, ask you to imagine another situation where there's only one firm, so we call this monopoly. Where would the monopoly produce at? Which row would we be at if a monopoly could choose? What do you guys think? $40 price. Why? I agree with that. Because what's the monopoly going to do? The monopoly is just going to look at all of these points and say, where's the highest profit? <laughs> I'll produce there. That's what they do, right? That's what monopolists do. So they're like $1,800. I'm going to go ahead and produce at this point if there's a monopoly. 
right? So we have price equals 40, quantity equals 60, and $1,800 worth of profit. We know this is much worse for society, though, right? The best point for society, remember, was this, was this row. This is best for maybe the monopolist, but it's not good for society. The monopolist is making all kinds of money. Okay. So now that we know the like the best point for society, and this is kind of like the worst point for society, if I go ahead and add two firms in there now, we'll call it a duopoly, I know it's got to be somewhere in between, right? Because a duopoly, they're going to compete with each other and they're going to lower the price a little bit, but they're not going to lower it all the way to here, perfect competition, right? So I know that the duopoly is going to be somewhere in between these two, okay? And the question is where? So I have to walk you through the steps of finding the, um, du the oligopoly equilibrium because it's a little bit more difficult. Okay, so let's imagine that... So there's a, there's a lot of different possible outcomes. One of the duopoly, or oligopoly, right? A duopoly is just an oligopoly with two firms, right? One of the possible outcomes is collusion. So what does collusion mean? It's an agreement among firms in a market about quantities to produce or prices to charge. OK? So if the two firms get together and they're like, let's just chat here. Let's jointly together determine what the price is going to be. Let's not actually compete. Let's not be competitors. Let's be friends. That's what the two firms are saying. OK, let's collude. So imagine that one of you guys is T-Mobile, one of you guys is Verizon, and you get together, and you're like, let's be friends. Let's not try to like, you know, undercut each other in prices. Because when you think of two firms, a lot of times you think of like, oh, one guy's selling for 40, so the other guy's going to sell for 35 and so to try to get all the customers. The other guy's going to sell the 30, right? Well, they're killing each other because they're lowering the prices, right? So they're like, no, no, we're not going to compete with each other. Let's just be friends. Let's help each other out. So that's called collusion. Now imagine where they, would, where they would collude. If they got together and they were smart, what would they say? They'd be like, hmm, I know for a fact that this row right here is the maximum amount of profit that can be made in this society, right? Because that's where the monopoly would have picked. I know that this is the maximum amount. So guess what, T-Mobile? and Verizon, we're going to go ahead and sell for $40 a piece, our cell phones for $40 a piece, which means that there's going to be 60 total phones sold. So how many phones does each firm sell? Right? 60 total phones, two firms. So they each sell out of that, which is what? 30, right? If they each sell 30 phones for $40 a piece, they're going to be on this row. Does that make sense? They'll be on this row, which is the maximum profit uh, row. And they'll each get how much profit? Well, they'll split it. They'll each get $900 in profit, OK? And that's like the theoretical best that either of the firms could do, because they're just teaming up together and acting like a monopoly. Does that make sense? We know a monopoly is going to maximize their profit in the marketplace. So if they just each act like half a monopoly, well, they'll maximize their profit. And so that's one possible point that they could, uh, that they could collude on, right? They could agree to each do be half of a monopoly. So each firm will produce 30, and the price will be 40, and they'll make $900 worth of profits. That's from that monopoly row that I showed you. On the demand on the demand schedule last slide. Does that make sense? Why they would agree to this point? Hopefully, they're just both agreed to act like half of a monopoly. Okay, and when firms do this, it's called a cartel. It's a group of firms that act together as one. T-Mobile and Verizon. When they try to act like half a monopoly each, we call it a cartel. Anybody ever heard of the word cartel before? Where do you normally hear the word cartel in? Mexican drug cartels, right. So why are those called cartels? They, all the different organizations, they work as one for the purpose of what? 
making drugs really, really expensive, <laughs> right? Because they, they get a lot of profit when drugs are expensive, okay? So that's, that's why they're called cartels. There, uh, there's diamond cartels that try to raise the prices of diamonds. Um, the probably, another really well-known cartel is OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, right? So you know that all of the countries uh, Libya and Saudi Arabia and a lot of the Middle Eastern countries that have a lot of oil, what do they try to do? They get together and they say, hey, we're going to sell just a little tiny bit of oil for a really high price. We're going to try to, you know, monopolize the world's uh, oil and, and make a lot of profit. Okay? Just so you know, this is illegal in America. Right? It's illegal to, to, to collude on prices. Say you're the CEO of Verizon and you're talking to the CEO of T-Mobile, you're actually, it's illegal for you to even discuss prices. You can't even say what price you're going to sell at. Okay? It's completely illegal to, even in just like casual conversation, hey Tom, how you doing? We're thinking about selling the phones for $40. Uh-uh. No. That's illegal actually. And people, people have gone to jail for that. CEOs have. And well, how does that happen? Well, they're competitors, right? So if I hear this guy talking about prices, I'm just going to go ahead and report him and try to get him put in jail. And then all of a sudden, this country, the company's not going to do so well anymore, right? Because their CEO's in jail. So um, it's, it's rather strictly enforced, and people have, people have gone to jail for uh, talking about prices. But it, it is illegal because why do you think it's illegal? Right, we, we try to get away from monopoly in, in America because we know that monopoly is not the best for society, right? We like the perfect competition row because the perfect competition place is the best for society. Okay, so let's imagine that they're gonna, let's pretend that they're gonna do a cartel. Let's pretend that it's not illegal to be a cartel, okay? Let's see what happens. So we're gonna go ahead and say that they're gonna collude, which means they're gonna form a cartel and where are they going to uh, promise each other that they're going to uh, produce at? Each firm is going to agree to produce half of the monopoly output. And they'll get the profit of half of the monopoly profit, right? So each guy decides to be half a monopoly. And together they'll be the full monopoly and they'll maximize profits. OK, so here's what I want to, to see. Does either firm have the incentive to cheat, which means that they get together, they promise, hey, yeah, T-Mobile, I'm, I'm Verizon, T-Mobile, I'm going to produce half of the Monopoly outcome. Sure, dude, sure, dude. And, and T-Mobile says, Verizon, yeah, 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 that's great, me too. I'm, we're going to be half monopolists together, right? But then privately, they go, around, go away after the meeting, and they're like, dude, maybe I can make some more money here, right? Because that's, that's what all firms want to do. I'm going to cheat on my agreement. I'm going to try to sell a couple more phones, try to get a little more profit here, because I think he's going to... I think he's going to be trustworthy and uh, do what we agreed to, but I'm going to try to sell a couple more phones. So the question is, let's imagine T-Mobile cheats. We also call that renege, okay? If he reneges on the agreement, you guys ever heard this word, renege? Oh, don't renege. That means the, to go back on what you said, right? So if they renege, we use it a lot in economics. Or they cheat on the agreement, and he produces quantity equals 40. Remember how much he agreed to produce? 30. Let's say he produces 40. Why would he produce 40? To try to get a couple more profit, a little bit more profit, right? Because you can totally do that. What happens to the market price and what happens to his profits? Okay? So I'll go ahead and give you a couple seconds to figure this out. We're going to pretend the other guy still does 30. T-Mobile does 40. So that means in total how, much, how many cell phones are being produced? 70. So instead of being at this row like they had promised to be, they're actually going to be at this row. Now calculate, and using that price, calculate the profits for both of them, for T-Mobile and for Verizon. I'll give you guys a couple minutes to do this. Okay? And then tell me, does he want to cheat or not? Okay. Let's, let's check this out. So let's imagine that T-Mobile reneges, meaning he cheats and he produces more. Right? We know if he doesn't cheat and they stick to the agreement, he's going to get $900 in profits. Right? That was half of the monopoly profits. But let's say he cheats and produces 40. So instead of being at this row, they're now going to be making 70 total. 
And so uh, they are going to be selling for $35 a cell phone, not $40 a cell phone, right? Because they can't sell that many. So the market quantity is 70. The price is now 35. So let's see how much T-Mobile will make. T-Mobile is going to be selling 40 cell phones. How much profit do they make per cell phone? Well, they're selling each cell phone for 35. What's the marginal cost per cell phone? $10. So they're making $25 in profit per cell phone times 40 cell phones. That's $1,000 in total profits. What do you notice between that number and that number? It's $100 more. So what does T-Mobile want to do? Be a good little guy and, and stick to his illegal cartel agreement? Or does he want to cheat? Which one, what does T-Mobile want to do? He wants to cheat. All by himself, he wants to cheat. right? He didn't need a government telling him, hey, this cartel thing's going to be legal. Right? He didn't need that. He cheated all on his own. Okay? Uh, because what do firms care about? What's really the only thing firms care about? Profit maximization, right? In the most simple way to look at it. Firms only care about profit maximization. He looks, he does the math. He's got some PhD in economics that works for T-Mobile. And he's like, mm, gentlemen, you know, if we went ahead and cheated and produced 40 cell phones instead of the 30 that we agreed on, we're going to make $100 extra profits. OK? So he's going to cheat. But then what do we know about what's Verizon going to do? Is Verizon sitting over here trying to be a little era, uh, cherub, an angel? listening to the agreement? Or what's Verizon going to do? What do you think Verizon's going to do? They're going to do the same math problem. And Verizon is going to produce how many? They're going to cheat, too, to 40. OK? So uh, OK, yeah. So T-Mobile's profits are higher if it reneges, right? So it wants to cheat. Now, what's Verizon going to do? Verizon is going to say, hmm, if we cheat, we get higher profits, too. So what is Verizon? How much? Is Verizon going to produce? They're also going to, to cheat on their agreement and produce 40. They're going to produce more than they agreed upon. right? So now we have the situation where both firms get together. They're like, yeah, I promise you I'm only going to make 30, and we'll sell them for $40 a piece. And they each go away, and they each make 40, actually. right? And so what does that do to the profits? Well, this was the agreed upon row. We move up to this row if one guy cheats. But if both people cheat and make 40, what row are we on now, actually? This row, right? Why? Because now they're making 80 total quantity. OK? And now that means they're going to sell it for how much? 30 bucks a pop, right? So we've moved up to this row. So this is like the double cheat row, where they both cheat. And they're both going to, because they both have, know what's going on. So they're both going to sell at, for $30 a piece. So now what's profit's actually going to be? We have market quantity is going to be 80. Price is going to be 30. And the profits for each firm, they're going to sell 40 phones each. And now they're only going to make $20 a profit on a phone, because they only sell for $30. And it costs the cost for each phone is $10. So they make $20 profit on each phone times 40. They only make $800 profit. Okay. So now what do you notice? This is actually worse off than if they would have stopped cheating, right? Here's the thing. Each firm gets together, and they're like, OK, I promise to do half a monopoly, and that means I'm going to earn 900, and you're going to earn 900. But then they go away, and they each privately think, oh, but if I cheat, I can make 1,000. And the other guy's like, well, if I cheat, I can make $1,000 profit. So when they both cheat, they each end up making 800. So it actually goes down, right? So it's actually, they're worse off by cheating, but they're encouraged to cheat because they see this thousand that they could get, right? They like imagine, oh, what if the other guy doesn't cheat and only I cheat? Then they could get a thousand, OK? So the, the idea here is that they won't pick this. They won't pick the monopoly outcome because they'll try to cheat to get the 1,000, but they'll both end up getting 800, actually. Okay. So this is collusion versus self-interest. Collusion, do they work together? Or self-interest, do they only care about themselves? So we just saw, mathematically, from a profit-maximizing standpoint, they're actually both going to not work together. They're going to, to do their own thing and try to cheat. Okay. Both firms would be better off if they stuck to the agreement the cartel agreement, 
where they each make half of Monopoly's output. Both firms would be better off. Right? But each firm has a profit motive. They have an incentive to renege on the agreement, which means they have the incentive to cheat on the agreement. Okay. Um, so the basic lesson here is, is it easy for firms to form a cartel? No. It's really difficult because every firm always wants to cheat. What do you know about, for example, the Mexican drug cartel? Is it a pretty safe place to work? No. They're constantly shooting each other, right? Why do you think that's the case? This right here, right? How are they convincing the others to stick to their agreement, right? They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. We're going to go ahead and, and stick together and form Monopoly. Oh, by the way, if you cheat, I'll shoot your head, right? That is the, the enforcement net mechanism because we know that on their own, the oligopolists want to cheat. The, the drug company, the drug runners, the narcotraficantes, whatever you call them down there, they want to cheat on each other. So they have to uh, have really intense enforcement mechanisms to keep the other guy from cheating. OPEC is a, is a good example, actually. You know, every year they get together and they meet and they're like, okay, guys, we're only going to produce a little bit of oil and we're going to sell it on the market and we're going to make a killing. But then each of the countries leave that meeting and what do they do? They're like, hey, turn on the oil pumps really high, right? We're going to try to sell as much as we can while the price is high. Well, all of the firms do that. So they flood the market with oil and the price goes down. Okay? So... OPEC, in all honesty, tries every year to withhold oil and keep the price up, but everybody go, leaves that meeting and then they turn on their oil wells and, and, and the price comes down more than what they wanted. It still maybe is up higher than it would be if they all turned them on full blast, but um, it's, they never can get to their agreement. They never, they never can honor their agreement. Okay. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's keep thinking about this oligopoly situation. Um, remember what they originally had agreed upon. They originally had agreed upon to be at this row, where they're going to make 30, a 30 each, and so they'll have 60 total and they'll sell for 40. But we, then we found out that if they cheated, right, by making instead of 30, they made 40, they each would make 40, they would be at this row, uh, selling 30, and we found out that even though it's worse for them to cheat, they're going to cheat because they're trying to get to that $1,000 of profit, each of them, right? And they end up cheating here. So now they're at this point where they're producing quantity equals 40, the market quantity is 80, right? So they're at this point right here, right? And each firm's profit is $800 a piece. I guess it's natural to ask, will they cheat even more, right? They're going to keep cheating until when? They can't get higher profits by cheating, right? They're going to look and they'll be like, hmm, should I do what I'm doing or should I cheat even more? Well, if I get more higher profits from cheating even more, then I will. Okay? So let's walk through this. Let's ask the question, should it cheat now from 40 to 50? Should it make even more um, to 50? And the answer is going to be, if the profit would go up, then yes. If the profit does not go up, then no, right? So, so we can kind of analyze this together. If T-Mobile, I guess it's not really cheating at this point because they've already started cheating, but goes to 50 while the other guy stays at 40, what row are they going to be at? They're going to be at this row, right? So let's just calculate profit for T-Mobile, right? How much profit is he going to be making per phone? Well, he's selling it now for 25 bucks. $10 cost per phone is $15 per phone times his 50 phones. Um, whoops. Let's see that right here. All right. So uh, quantity is 50. That means the market quantity is, is 90, so they're going to be at this row. And the price is 25. So let's see what T-Mobile's profit's going to be. 
each phone they make now, see this market price is just falling, right? The market price is falling because as you increase output, this keeps going down. Now they're only making, what's that, $15 per phone of profit times 50 phones, $750. So if T-Mobile cheats further to 50, his profit goes from, right, if they, if they keep cheating, if they both cheat to 40, it's going to go to 800, right? But if he decides to cheat further, it's going to go down to 750. So is T-Mobile going to cheat any further? No, he totally won't. T-Mobile's profits are higher at 40 than when he produces 50. Okay, so therefore, he's going to stick at quantity equals 40. T-Mobile will. Verizon, they have the exact same math going on. Verizon's going to come to the same conclusion. Verizon's like, hmm, I make more profit at 40 than at 50, so I'm not going to cheat to 50. I'll stay at 40. Okay? Same is true for Verizon. Okay? So now we got to a point where on their own, neither firm is going to change their output. They're both going to stick at 40. Does that under, uh, ex understand why they're going to stick at 40? We call that the equilibrium for an oligopoly. Okay, no, an oligopoly equilibrium. So it's not the really low price, perfectly competitive equilibrium. It's not the really high price monopoly equilibrium. It's in the middle. Okay, and uh, and the specific type of equilibrium it's called is called the Nash equilibrium. Okay, and basically. It's a special equilibrium in which each of the people, each of the economic participants interacting with one another, choose their best strategy given the strategies that all others have chosen. So here's the idea. T-Mobile's sitting here and they're like, look, if Verizon picks 40 quantity, it's best for me to pick 40 quantity to produce, right? And then Verizon's over here thinking the same thing. If T-Mobile does 40, I should do 40. So then both parties jointly decide to produce 40, okay? So they'll be at the, the 80 total quantity row of that, of that demand schedule, okay? That's called the Nash equilibrium, all right? So each firm makes quantity equals 40. That's the Nash equilibrium for, for the cell phone example, okay? So uh, why, is it a, why is it a Nash equilibrium? Because if Verizon does 40, T-Mobile decides to do 40. And if T-Mobile does 40, then Verizon decides to do 40. So both of them are like, ah, oh, the best thing I can do, given what this guy chose, is this. And it's the best. Everybody has, is choosing the best response to the other guy's best response. Nobody has an incentive to change. We call that a Nash equilibrium. Okay? So we have this kind of weird equilibrium concept here in, in oligopoly, which is a little bit more complex than in the other market structures we, that we've studied so far. Okay, so let's compare. Uh, when firms in an oligopoly individually choose production to maximize profit, the oligopoly quantity is greater than the monopoly quantity, right? They, they, they both cheated a little bit from the monopoly quantity and produced more, but they didn't quite get to the competitive quantity. Does that make sense? They didn't quite get to the competitive quantity. Um, and the price, right? It's the price came is higher than the competitive, the perfectly competitive price, but it's less than the monopoly price, right? They came down from the monopoly price some, but they didn't come all the way down to, to the perfectly competitive level. All right. Whoops. Right. So this is the competitive out. Whoops. This is the competitive outcome right here. Right. This is the monopoly outcome right here. What is the oligopoly outcome? That's where they each do 40 a piece, right? So if they each do 40, that means there's 80 total quantity. That means this is the row for uh, oligopoly equilibrium. You see that? This is the row for oligopoly equilibrium. This is the row for competitive. This is the row for monopoly. This is oligopoly. So the price is not super high at 40. It's not super low at 10. It's in the middle. It's 30. Okay. The Quantity is not super low at 60. It's not super high up here at 120, but the quantity is 80, so it's right in the middle. It's not exactly in the middle, but the idea here is that 
by going from monopoly and adding in one more, one more competitor, it dropped the price somewhat. It didn't drop it all the way to here. Okay. Is my is my society better off because we have an extra competitor? In here? Yeah, you better believe they're better off, right? They were paying forty dollars a piece for their cell phone. Now they only have to pay thirty dollars for their cell phone, right? This is much better for society. You guys maybe remember back when like broadband cable internet first started coming out, like whoever was your cable provider, like Time Warner or Charter or whatever the name of it was, they had the they were the only person selling the fast high speed internet and it was really expensive. It was like a hundred bucks a month. Now you've got a couple more people who you can get high speed internet from at your house and it's made the price go down somewhat. In this example, with one firm, they're selling $40 a piece. Each phone is $40. With two firms, they sold $30 a piece. What do you think if there was three firms or four firms? What would happen to the price? It would go down even more, right? The more firms you add in there, the, the closer this starts to get to the perfectly competitive outcome. Does that make sense? So. You start with one firm selling, it's a monopoly. You go to two firms, it's a duopoly. If you did three firms, maybe it would be a triopoly. I don't really know, right? Or four firms. Uh, as you add more and more firms, it starts to approach the perfectly competitive outcome. This is why we like competition. This is why we like breaking up monopolies into several different companies, right? Because it's better for society. It starts ar arriving at the perfectly competitive outcome. OK, so uh, how, do, how does this happen? Well, there's output and price effects. Remember that if you increase output, and we talked about this for the monopolist, right? when you increase output, you make more quantity, two things happen to your, prof, to your revenue. Okay? First of all, well, actually, let's look at it uh, according to profits. What happens to profits? When price is higher than the marginal cost, so meaning you're making money on each product sold, if you make more output, you raise profits. Right? If price is greater than marginal cost, increasing output raises profits. That's called the output effect. However, if you, make, if you raise your output, right, if you sell more quantity because of the demand curve, right? if you sell out more on the quantity, you have to drop the price on each, on each good sold. right? So increases the market quantity, which reduces the price and reduces profits on all units sold. Right? So you have these, these two effects on profits. You want to sell a little more because you're, you're getting more profits per product, but then you get to a point where if you keep selling more, you're actually going to start making your profit go down because you're having to lower the price on all of the previously sold units also. Right? Okay. So. If the output effect is greater than the price effect, right? So if, you, if, it, if it's good to raise profits by increasing output, that's what this is, then the firm's going to make a higher amount of production. Cheat, as, you, as, as we called it earlier, right? For T-Mobile and Verizon, they got together and they agreed to just do the monopoly, out, uh, the monopoly output, but they decided to go ahead and inc increase production, regardless of what the law says or what their agreement said or anything, right? They, they pr increased production until the price effect became bigger than the output effect, then they stopped, right? Because if the price effect is greater than the output effect, the firm reduces production. So they were here at first, they increased production actually until these two effects were equal and then they stopped production. So the lesson here is that firms are going to keep increasing their production until it's not profitable to do it anymore. They're not going to care about the law. They're not going to care about their agreements with each other. They're only going to look at their profit. Okay. So, size of the oligopoly. As the number of firms in the market increases, that means that the, the, there's more firms in the oligopoly, what's going to happen? We kind of talked about this a little bit a couple minutes ago, right? When it goes from a monopoly to a duopoly to a threeopoly to a fouropoly, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to the, to the price effect is going to become smaller. Okay. The, the, uh, the output effect stays the same, so the oligopoly starts to look more and more like a competitive marketplace. 
Remember how I said as you keep adding more firms, it, uh, it approaches or arrives at that row that was the perfectly competitive row. Okay. And the reason why is because as there's more and more firms, when you increase your output, it doesn't actually increase the total output of the whole marketplace that much. So the, the price doesn't fall that much. So you just keep increasing output, okay? And, uh, and, and the price comes to the marginal cost. Remember, this is important. When price approaches marginal cost, when price is at marginal cost, we know it's the best place for a society. Because price is how much people are willing to pay. It's our measure of how much they value the product. This is how much it costs society to make the product. If people value the product a lot more than marginal cost, more than the cost to make the product, we want to keep making the product until the price comes down to, pro to hit marginal cost. That's where we want to stop at. Okay? And then when price approaches the market marginal cost, the market quantity approaches the socially efficient quantity. And if you have a question, you're like, where's the socially efficient quantity again? Remember, it's just the quantity at the perfectly competitive mar uh, row. Right? Perfectly competitive is like our best for society point. So if you want to know what's the socially efficient quantity, it's easy. You just look at the perfect competition quantity. However much is going to be produced in perfect competition is like best for society. Okay. So just a, an, a thought here. Remember way back at the beginning, one of our uh, big ideas was that trade can make people better off. Well, if you open your country to international trade, then more companies can come in and sell, and then it might turn an oligopoly into a perfectly competitive market, and that might be better. Okay. So imagine, like the idea here is, imagine there's a monopoly. There's just one company that produces, I don't know, soda or something like that, right? And it's a monopoly. It's not very good for society. But then all of a sudden, if you open your country to international trade and a bunch more soda companies can come in, right? It creates more competition and it starts making it look like perfect competition, which is good for society, right? So international trade, just in the number of firms, right? Just because it can increase the number of firms can actually be better for society because it breaks up the monopoly power. All right. So let's... Uh, let's, let's uh, investigate a little bit more on the game theory. So don't forget, game theory is the way that we understood oligopoly. Game theory only works when what you do influences what I do, and what I do influences what you do. We call that strategic behavior. We only see this in oligopolies. We don't see this in perfectly competitive or monopolistically competitive or monopoly firms. Okay. And so why is it called game theory? Well, uh, it's the theory of how people do games. Games are like any time two people come together and they try to have some strategic interaction. Right? So in, in this language, when T-Mobile and Verizon get together and they try to decide how much quantity to make, that's a game. Right? And this is the theory of it. This isn't like, oh, this is the theory of checkers or the theory of chess, right? This is, this is a, it's like, a, it's a different way to think of game. Okay. Now, there's this, uh, let me define a term. There's this thing called the dominant strategy. And basically, it's any strategy that is the best for one of the players, right, where the players are, are like T-Mobile and Verizon, to pick regardless of what everybody else chooses. If they have a dominant strategy, it means it's always the best for them to pick. And another uh, definition, there's this thing called the prisoner's dilemma. And it's a game, okay, between two people, in, in the original story it was two captured criminals, that shows why you just can't cooperate no matter what. Okay? Uh, we saw that T-Mobile and Verizon, even though they tried to cooperate and form a cartel and form a mini monopoly, right? 
They couldn't. They both ended up cheating. We're going to explain the why. We're going to explain why using this story called The Prisoner's Dilemma. Now, it's a kind of a weird story. I didn't make it up, but I'm just going to tell you the way that they made it up. Some philosopher back in the 1800s made, made this up, thought this up. And um, so, let me, so let me tell you the story. This prisoner's dilemma. It's kind of cool. Kind of a cool idea. Uh, so here's the example. The police have caught two people, Bonnie and Clyde, we'll call them. All right. These weren't the actual names in the original story, but this just kind of makes it a little more interesting. Uh, so two suspected bank robbers, but only have enough evidence to imprison each for one year. So the police capture two people. They're like, I got some minor petty crimes on you, but I think that you did this really big jewel heist at the bank, right? However, with just the tiny small information that I have, I only can imprison you each for one year, OK? Uh, but then they take them in separate rooms, and they offer each of the ones the following deal. They're like, hey, look, OK, if you confess and say, yeah, we did, me and Clyde, we both stole the, the jewels, right? this big, huge thing, then I'll let you go free. And because I now have information on this guy, I'm going to put him in jail for like 20 years. OK. Um, on the other side, though, if you refuse to confess and your buddy confesses and says you were the one who stole these jewels, you're going to be the one that get the 20 years. OK? So here's the options, right? Nobody talks to the police at all, and then the police have no extra info, and they can only put each of them for, for one year apiece. Right? But if this guy rats this guy out, then he's like, oh, then now I have enough information. I'll put him in jail for 20 years. But if this guy rats this guy out, the police are like, oh, now I have enough you know, information to put this guy in jail for 20 years. Okay? And if you both rat each other out <laughs> at the same time, then we'll put you each in jail for ten, eight years. Eight years. We'll, we'll split the, the prison sentence. We won't make it a full 20. Because you did cooperate with us a little bit, right? But, uh, but the other guy ratted you out, so I still got to punish you some. Okay? So there's the options. They can either get uh, one year if each of them is quiet. Okay? If this guy rats out this guy, this guy gets 20 and this guy gets nothing. Right? If this guy rats out this guy, this guy gets 20 and this guy gets nothing. Or if they both rat out each other, they both tell on each other, then they each get eight. So that's all the possible options that could happen here, right? Um, so let's go ahead and put that on, we call this a payoff matrix. A matrix is just kind of like a square, <laughs> right? And we're going to list all of the payoffs or all of the, the stuff that comes to you after engaging in this game, all right? So, up here we put one player, up here, down here we put one player, and we put their strategies next to the player. So what are the two options that Clyde could do? He could either, he only has two options. Make this super simple. He could either confess and rat out the other guy, or he could not talk to the police. This person, Bonnie, could either confess and rat out Clyde, or it could remain silent. All right? So since each person only has two options of what they could do, there's four total outcomes for this game. One, two, three, four, right? There's only four total outcomes to this game. And we can fill in what happens to each person. We call those the payoffs. The things that happen to each person, we call it the payoffs. So let's do this one first, OK? What's going on in this square? Well, let's look. What's Clyde doing? He's confessing. What's Bonnie doing? She's confessing. So remember what happens to each person if they rat each other out simultaneously? They both get eight years. OK. So they both get eight years. You see how this box is green? That's going to be what Bonnie gets. You see how this part of the box is yellow? That's going to be what Clyde gets. right? They both have to go in this one box because this is like the outcome where they both confess. OK? So Bonnie gets eight years here. OK? Now, what happens? In this box for Bonnie, uh, what's going on in this box? Well, Clyde is still confessing. Bonnie is remaining silent, right? So this person's being quiet, and this person's ratting out this person. Okay, so the person that got ratted out, what happens? They get 20 years in prison, right? And just for convenience, 
right? We put this payoff closer to Bonnie to kind of like show you that this is what happens to Bonnie, right? We'll put Clyde's payoff down here because it's closer to Clyde, okay? Now, let's suppose that Clyde decides to remain silent, right? Because in, in, in both of these situations, Clyde was confessing to the police. Let's suppose that he remains silent. Okay, so I don't want to show you them yet. I want you to think this through. Clyde remains silent. So let's look and see what happens here to Bonnie, okay? Because Bonnie has a decision. She can either choose confess or remain silent. Let's just look. And, and let's say that she's making that decision given that Clyde decided to remain silent. Okay, so Bonnie has a choice. If she confesses and this guy remains silent, she rats out the other guy. She gets to go free. This guy, of course, is going to go to jail for 20 years, but we're not there yet. Okay? If they both are quiet, you remember what happened if they're both quiet? The police only have enough information to put them both in jail for a year. Yeah? Okay. So here's the total payoff for Bonnie. When you do these game uh, payoff matrices, do one row at a time. Like, so here's how I think of it. I think of it like, let's just fix Clyde at confessing. Let's just pretend Clyde is going to confess no matter what. So that way I can, I can get away from this row and I just look at the row where Clyde confesses. And then I'm just like, oh, Bonnie can either confess or remain silent. And I, I do the two options for her. It's way easier to do it this way. Okay. And then when you're done with that, you're like, cover up this row. And now we're going to do the row where, where he remains silent. And then she's still got only two choices. And so I look at her two choices. Okay. Now. Let's do it where we set Bonnie to uh, confess. Yeah, that's where we are. Whoops. We're going to set, so now we're going to cover up this part. And we're going to say, OK, let's pretend Bonnie just confesses only. Now what's Clyde's options? Given that Bonnie has confessed, if Clyde also confesses, what does he get? Eight years, right? Because both of them are confessed at the same time. So there'll be eight years here. Now. Given that Bonnie's going to confess, let's suppose Clyde decided to keep his mouth shut. What happens? Bonnie rats him out. He doesn't say anything. What happens to him? He gets 20 years, right? So we have he gets eight years here, and he gets 20 years here. OK. So now let's cover up this one, and let's imagine that Bonnie decides to remain silent. What's Claude going to get? She's silent. He's ratting her out. What's he going to get? Free. He gets to go free, OK? And on the other hand, she, uh, uh, excuse me, um, she's remaining silent this whole time. He decides to also remain silent. What's he going to get? Only one year, right? So we got Clyde goes free, and Clyde, Clyde gets one year. So now we have the full payoff matrix filled in. We have every possible outcome, because we made this a really simple story with only two possible outcomes per two strategies per person, that means four total outcomes. And in each outcome, they each get something happen to them, right? So there's two payoffs per outcome. Okay, so there's four total outcomes. We have the entire story on a, on a, on a table. Okay, we have the entire story written on a table. So who's going to pick what? Here's the idea. Look at it and tell me where like the best outcome is. What do you think is the best for society, where society is Bonnie and Clyde? Yeah, this is clearly the best, right? How much total jail time is there there? Two years total. They each have one year, right? This is not good. <laughs> that's 16 years of total jail time. This one's not good either. That's 20 total years of jail time. This one's not good. 20 total years of jail time, OK? So what do you think is the natural outcome of this game going to be? Or what should it be? What would society like it to be? Right? So we're going to kind of think of this area as like maybe the best spot. All right? We're going to think of this as the best spot. Maybe we're going to talk about this as like, hey, if they collude and act like a cartel, maybe they'll end up here. OK? Well, let's, let's, let's look at this. The problem is confessing is the dominant strategy for both players. Why? Let's examine. Suppose that, let's pretend we're Clyde. Suppose that we're like, OK, we're Clyde. Bonnie, 
give it, let's pretend that Bonnie confesses. Let's pretend that Bonnie's just going to confess, right? What does Clyde want to do? He wants to confess, right? Because he, he's like, OK, if Bonnie confesses, I get a choice. I can go to jail for eight years or 20 years. Better to go to jail for only eight years. So he's going to choose confess here. Let's suppose now, we'll cover this up. Let's suppose that we imagine Bonnie keeps her mouth shut. What's Clyde got? He's got the option between going free and going to jail for a year. What's he going to pick? Confess, right? Going free, because that's confessing. No matter what Bonnie chooses, what's Clyde always going to do? Pick confess. Okay. Let's do the same thing for Bonnie. Let's pretend we're Bonnie now. Okay. So Clyde's decision was this one, up and down. Bonnie's decision is left or right. Okay. So let's pretend that, that we're Bonnie and he's Clyde, and we're just going to pretend Clyde's going to confess no matter what. Okay, so I cover up this. Clyde's going to confess no matter what. What's Bonnie has a choice. She has a choice between confessing and remaining silent. She has a choice between eight years and 20 years. What's she always going to pick? Eight years, right? Let's do the same here. Let's, let's imagine that we pretend that Clyde's just going to remain silent. Okay, now Bonnie has a choice between going free and getting one year. She's going to pick going free. She's going to pick confess. Both people are going to pick confess no matter what. So where are they going to end up at? This guy. Everybody see how that happened? OK. So the Nash equilibrium whoops, is where both confess. This is the place that they're going to end up at. How weird is that? How weird is that? They want to be at this point. Keep mouth shut. Everybody keeps their mouth shut, right? Don't confess, don't confess. But they end up being at this point. This is the Nash equilibrium. Why is that? They're both trying to save themselves. Does anybody see how this is exactly the same as the Verizon and T-Mobile example? Exactly the same, right? They get together. And they say, hey, 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 don't rat me out. I promise not to rat you out. You don't rat me out. We're both going to remain silent. Look, it's only a year. It's not that bad, right? And then they go away. And then when does Bonnie look? He's like, or what does Clyde do? He's like, OK, we're going to be here. We're both going to get a year. But guess what? If I cheat, I could push myself up into here, right? If I, instead of remaining silent, I don't, I don't listen to my agreement and I go confess, instead of being here, I could be here. I like that, right? So he chooses here. Bonnie, she does the same thing. She says, OK, we're going to be here. Right? And I have a choice between these two things. But I said I'd do this. But if I go over here, if I go ahead and cheat, if I confess, I could be here. Each person is trying to get this go free thing. And so they each go to confess which actually makes them end up here where it's worse off. This is exactly the same thing as the oligopoly equilibrium we saw with Verizon and T-Mobile, right? Remember, they tried to agree on the monopoly outcome, but they both cheated until they got the, the, uh, the oligopoly equilibrium, which is not as good. Okay, So the outcome is that Bonnie and Clyde both confess, and they each get eight years in prison. This is so sad, <laughs> right? They, they, they couldn't cooperate. It's just impossible because they were each, like, I mean, they're prisoners after all. They're robbers, I guess, Bonnie and Clyde, right? Maybe they're just trying to maximize their own happiness, minimize their jail time. It would have been better off if both remained silent, right? They each would have only gotten one year. OK. So here's the, here's the craziness. It's actually impossible to get to that, that better equilibrium. Or I guess it's not equilibrium. It's actually bet, it's impossible to get to that outcome where they each only go to jail for one year apiece. It's impossible. Even if they had met together beforehand and promised each other to keep their mouth closed, they still would have gone and they would have ratted each other out to the police. It's impossible to get that one, one year, one year out.
So, oligopolies are actually this prisoner's dilemma. Um, when they form the cartel in hopes of reaching the monopoly outcome, they become the players in the prisoner's dilemma. This story happens to them. Okay. So the early example with T-Mobile and Verizon, remember they're duopolists in small town? We can put this on a prisoner's dilemma payoff matrix and analyze it the exact same way, right? So here's, here's what we're going to do. The monopoly outcome, the cartel outcome, was that each person was going to do 30. Each, phone, each person was going to make 30 phones. Uh, and now let's go ahead and, and write the payoff matrix. Okay. So let's look at it. We have two total, two possible options. Verizon can do 30 or 40, right? We're just going to make this super simple. They could go actually 31, 32, 33, 34. They could go anywhere in between. Let's make this as simple as possible. Verizon has a choice between 30 and 40. T-Mobile has a choice between 30 and 30 and 40, right? What was the monopoly outcome or the the agreed upon outcome? Well, they both agreed to only make 30, right? which would give us this box here, right? Remember they made a 900 and 900? Okay. But then, do you remember what happened? When, let's say that they both agreed to make 30-30, but then T-Mobile's like, oh, remember, I can cheat. If I cheat, I get more. Remember T-Mobile's profit went up to 1,000 when he cheated? All right. If you do the math, Verizon only gets 750 at that same point. Okay. T-Mobile, or not T-Mobile, sorry, Verizon, for their side, on their part, they're here and they're like, ah, if I cheat and I make 40, my profit goes up to 1,000. Remember that was them too? T-Mobile then will go down to 750, right? And so they're at this agreed upon point, but T-Mobile looks and says, hey, if I just switch to here, I could get 1,000. Verizon says, hey, if I switch here, I could get 1,000. So they both cheat. Which now means, since we're both picking this, we're actually in this square, and they're at 800 apiece. Do you see that? So this is the place they want to be, but this is impossible to get to. What's the Nash equilibrium? This guy. The Nash equilibrium is that guy. OK. In case something like this shows up on a task and I ask you where the Nash equilibrium is, let me show you how to find it. It's not that hard. Okay. You pretend you're Verizon, right? And you cover up, let's cover up this spot right here. We'll cover this, this spot. Say, so pretend that T Mobile makes 30. Okay. What do I want to do as Verizon? I have a choice between 900 and 1,000. Obviously, I'm going to pick 40. Okay because I have a choice between 900 and 1,000, so I pick 40 in this situation. Now in this situation, okay, what do I got? I got a choice between 750 and 800. I'm going to pick 800, right? Which means I'm going to pick this guy again. So it means I'm always going to pick quantity equals 40. Okay, so I should maybe circle that on my paper or something. Okay, now let's do the same thing. Let's pretend I'm T-Mobile, right? So I have a choice. T-Mobile has a choice between 30 and 40. Okay, So let's cover up this row right now and pretend Verizon does 30. I have a choice between 30 and 40, which means I have a choice between 900 and 1,000. I'm going to pick 40 equals 40. Cover up this guy, right? And now let's say pr pretend Verizon is, on, is doing this row and I can have a choice between here or here. Whoops. I can choose 750 to, or 800. So I'm going to go ahead and pick 40. Each, per, each party is going to make 40 we're going to end up at that point. And that's the Nash equilibrium. That's how to find the equilibrium. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's very important to note that this is like the preferred outcome, but it's impossible to get to it. This is the one that they're going to get to. Okay, That's the one they're going to get to. We call this the Nash equilibrium. It's like the general name for it. In the specific case, when it's two oligopolies competing with each other, we call it the oligopoly equilibrium as well. Okay. This right here, don't forget, was the monopoly outcome. This is the oligopoly outcome. Okay. So the dominant strategy for each firm was to cheat, was to renege, and go to 40. 
And that means that, uh, whoops, that I meant to circle this, but that this is the Nash equilibrium. Let's do a game where we have two players. One of them is called American, and one of them is called United Airlines. And they have a strategy. They have two choices. They can either cut the fares by 50% or leave the fares. Right? The fare is how much they charge for an airplane ticket. Right? So they can either drop the prices by 50% or they could keep them. Okay. So let's, let's look here. If both airlines drop their prices by 50%, they're each going to make $400 million in profit. Okay. If neither airline cuts fares, right, they're going to make $600 million obviously, because they're going to make more profit if the, if the tickets stay high, right? But the interesting thing is, what happens if just one person cuts their ticket prices and the other person leaves them really high? Well, everybody's going to go to the, to the company that cut their ticket prices, right? And they're going to make a killing all of a sudden, right? So if only one airline cuts its fares, the other, its profit is 800 million because everybody goes, even though they're selling cheap tickets, everybody's going to that airplane, airline. And they're going to make 800 million. The other person is only going to make 200 million because all the customers left. Okay? So now let's ask what the Nash equilibrium is going to be. Okay? What's the Nash equilibrium is? So first we need to pay, find the payoff, draw the payoff matrix. Then we can find the Nash equilibrium. Okay? So I'll give you guys a chance to do that. Whoops, I don't want to give you the answer yet. So put American Airlines on one side, United Airlines, and they have a choice. They can cut or not cut. And fill in, I think I have an empty spot on your guys' notes to do that. So take a couple minutes and try to fill that out. And then we'll talk about where the Nash equilibrium is. OK, let's check this out. So we have the two players, United and American. They each have. Two choices. We call that two strategies. They can either cut the fares, make their tickets cheap, or don't cut fares. Right? So we know that if they both cut fares, what's the payoff? 400 to each. Okay? If they both don't cut fares, the payoff is 600 to each. Okay? And if only one cuts fares, everybody goes over there and they get 800 million while the other guy doesn't. Right? So if we're in the spot where United is cutting, and American is not cutting. Everybody's going to go fly United, and their payoff is going to be 800. And uh, the uh, Americans is going to be 200. It's the exact flip side for this guy. Uh, American's cutting, and that means everyone's going to go fly American. So he gets 800. United is not cutting their fares, so everybody leaves them. And they get 200. Okay. Let's see what the dominant strategy is. Whoops, I don't want to show you quite yet. So let's do this rather quickly. Okay. I'm going to pretend I'm united. That means I have a choice between top or bottom. Let's suppose that we're Americans going to cut fares. Let me cover up this real quick so we don't get distracted by it. Supposing that American is going to be in the cut fares uh, strategy, what do I have? I have a choice between cut and don't. I have a choice between 400 and 200. What do I choose? Cut fares. Okay. So United chooses cut fares there. Let's imagine that American Airlines is in this, going to be do this. What should I pick between cut and don't? 800 and 600. I should still pick this top one. It's 800. So in both situations, I'm going to pick cut fares. Okay. So I know that United Airlines is always going to pick cut fare to 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 make it be cheaper, drop the price of their tickets. I call this the dominant strategy for United Airlines is to cut fares. Dominant strategy. Let's do the same thing for American. Now I'm going to pretend I'm American. I have a choice between cutting or not. So let's cover up this right now. Let's suppose that we think that United is just going to do this. That means that gives me a choice between 400 and 200. I'm going to pick this one, cut fares. OK, flip. Let's suppose that American is going to do this. I have a choice between 800 and 600. I'm going to pick 800. That means American is always going to pick cut fares. That means that American's dominant strategy is to cut fares. If both of these guys' dominant strategy is to cut fares, I know they're both going to pick that. That means I'm going to be at this box. That's a prisoner's dilemma, isn't it? Why is it a prisoner's dilemma? Which box or which outcome do they actually both want to be at? 
They'd both rather be at this guy, right? But they can't get to that one. Anytime there's some nice outcome, but you can't get to it, you get to the not as good outcome, that's called a prisoner's dilemma. OK? That's called a prisoner's dilemma. Why can't we get to this? Well, even if they agree to do this, right? What's going to happen? Well, United Airlines like, dude, I could get 800 if I just go up to here, right? Same thing. Americans like, ah, I could get 800 if I just went up to here. So both of them pick to go to cut fares, and then they are ended up in this outcome. Okay. So anytime you have some good outcome, but you can't achieve it, you get another outcome in the Nash equilibrium, then uh, that's called a prisoner's dilemma. All right. So. Know how to do that. Know how to find dominant strategies in Nash equilibria uh, for the test and for the homework and stuff like that. OK? All right. Other examples of the prisoner's dilemma. Well, um, let's suppose that two firms spend millions on TV ads to steal business from each other. Each firm's ad cancels out the other person's ad. And so basically, they're just left running these really expensive ad campaigns that reduce their profits. Right? You know that this is actually very, very, this actually happened in the, oh goodness, what year was it? It's in the 80s, I can't remember when. It became illegal to advertise cigarettes on television. And you guys know that there's, you've never seen a, probably a cigarette ad on television, right? In the generation previous, though, they used to run all kinds of cigarette ads on television. Maybe you guys have heard of the Marlboro Man. It was a guy who rode a cowboy. He was a cowboy who rode a horse and smoked a lot and stuff like that. It was on TV all the time, right? Well, in the world of cigarettes, there's only two real big makers. Who are they? Uh, well, there's a bunch of different brand names, but there's actually only two makers. There's R.J. Reynolds Tobacco and uh, what's the other one called? I think it's Winston. Winston and R.J. Reynolds. So there's only, only two companies, OK? Um, and they make a whole bunch of different names. But uh, uh, those are the two companies. Now, they had this problem, right? Each person was spending millions of dollars on cigarette ads on television, right? But it wasn't doing anything. Because each of the, if each of them would just stop advertising, people would still just buy the same amount of cigarettes, right? The only reason for the, the, the advertisement was to try to steal other person's customers, right? So if one person stopped running the TV ads, the other person would run it and steal all their customers, right? So they were both like forced to spend all these millions of dollars, which is wasted profits, on television ads that actually weren't doing anything, right? But the problem is, that's a, that's a prisoner's dilemma, right? They want to both be not, not advertising, but if one of them stops advertising, the other one's just going to advertise and steal all their people, steal all their customers. So what did they do? This is ingenious. They actually set up foundations, campaigns, to make TV adverti cigarette advertising on TV illegal. These are the cigarette companies that are paying for this, right? This is crazy. And why did they do that, right? Well. Because of the prisoner's dilemma problem. Firms, we know oligopoly firms can't cooperate because they both end up cheating, right? And unlike the Mexican drug cartels, in America, you can't shoot someone if they cheat, right? That's what the, how the Mexican drug cartels came up with the solution to the problem. Um, so what did they do? They're like, look, I have, we need to make an agreement to not advertise, but we need to make a way to force both of us to follow our agreement, I get a good idea. Let's make it illegal to advertise on TV. All right? And so the elimination of TV advertising of cigarettes, amazingly, is actually an example of this. It was paid for by the cigarette companies to make it illegal to advertise cigarettes on TV so that they wouldn't have this problem with cheating. Because you couldn't cheat now because it was illegal to advertise. Pretty interesting, huh? Um, there's OPEC. I told you like o I told you about OPEC. They uh, try to sell very little oil and sell it for expensive. Right? That's the that's the cartel that they try to do. But 
the individual companies are always reneging and cheating and, and, and pumping more oil. Okay. Uh, think about you, the US and the USSR during the period of the Cold War. What did each country do? They just kept building more and more nuclear bombs and nuclear bombs and nuclear bombs, right? We spent billions, maybe trillions of dollars on nuclear weapons that nobody ever used, right? But what was the point? Just to keep the other guy from launching a nuclear bomb, right? It would have been way better if both countries just said, okay, no nuclear bombs at all. We'll save all that money, we'll feed the poor people in the country, right? But no, that was a complete prisoner's dilemma. They both had to spend all this money on nuclear weapons just to, just to not use them. Okay, so that's, that's a prisoner's dilemma. Uh, common resources. Remember this tragedy of the commons? Everybody eat, takes their sheep out onto the middle and they eat all the grass and the grass dies? Well, if everyone would just agree to keep their sheep off the grass, it would be fine, but everybody has an incentive to cheat. Right? Prisoner's dilemma. Okay, so uh, how does that do for society's welfare? Well, with the non-cooperative oligopoly equilibrium, that means the one where both people are cheating on each other, okay? It's bad for the oligopoly firms, right, when they're cheating on each other because they don't get the good outcome. But it was good for society, right? It dropped the price, made the price lower, it made more quantity. So the non-cooperative, meaning when, they, when they're cheating on each other, it was bad for the oligopoly firms because they didn't, weren't able to get monopoly profits but it was good for society. So in this case, the fact that the firms were cheating on each other was, was good for society, actually. It, turned, it starts looking like perfect competition. But in other prisoners' dilemma, it might actually be bad for society. In our Verizon and T-Mobile example, it was good when people were cheating on each other. Uh, good for society, bad for the firms. But let me give you some examples where it might not be good for society for people to cheat on each other, okay? The arms race, right? Remember that we talked about the military superpowers were building nuclear weapons? That ended up being bad because now as our, the world has spent billions of dollars on nuclear bombs, we have all this nuclear waste all over the place, and, and it was much worse for, for society. If we could have just somehow made both countries promise not to have nuclear bombs, then we would have been much better off, right? The same thing about the tragedy of the commons, the sheep eating too much grass, right? If everybody could just promise to not, uh, use, to not use the grass. Okay, here's another example where it's bad for society, okay, to when, 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 politician, when people cheat on each other. We're going to have the specific example of campaign ads. So let's imagine there's an election. There's two politicians. We'll call one R and one D, just, just because of those letters. Right? No. Suppose, suppose one, one person's like a Republican and one person's a Democrat. That's what that's from, right? Let's say that, have you guys ever seen, like pri right before an election, they have all of these like uh, TV commercials that's like paid for by one candidate? Oh, look how bad the other candidate is, right? They voted against, I don't know, giving lollipops to children, or you know, they come up with all these terrible things, right? That the other person did, right? This person once left a hamburger wrapper outside their yard and it blew and it was littering or something, right? So they have all these like ridiculous things um, to attack the other person. Well, let's uh, let's let's examine this like a prisoner's dilemma. Let's put this in a payoff matrix and see what the what the point is. Okay, imagine that the R candidate runs a negative ad that attacks the D candidate, right? So uh, a bunch of people stop voting for D. 3,000 fewer people will vote for D because they're like, oh my goodness, D is so bad. Look at this bad campaign. 3,000 people stop voting. 2,000 people just say, oh, I just am fed up with politics. But the other 1,000 of those people do end up voting for the R guy, right? So it's good for R to run this negative campaign ad, right? He gets 3,000 votes away from his competitor, and he gets 1,000 of them, OK? And let's flip it around. Let's say that this guy's going to run a negative ad on this guy. Same stuff happens, right? Uh, if he runs a negative ad attacking R, R loses 3,000 votes, and D gains 1,000. 2,000 people are just fed up with politics and don't vote anymore, OK? Uh, now, this sometimes happens. 
But they both get together and they have an agreement. They're like, I promise we will not engage in negative campaign ads. Right? That's called mudslinging, for those of you guys who know from the political science uh, viewpoint. We call that mudslinging. What do you think? Are they going to stick to this agreement or not? To not run negative cam campaign ads. This is a total prisoner's dilemma, and we always know what's the outcome always in prisoner's dilemma? People cheat, right? People renege on their agreement. So let's put this in a, in a prisoner's dilemma. Let's say that they ha each guy, D has a decision, do not run the attack ads or run the attack ads, right? Uh, R's got the same decision. Do not run the attack ads or run the attack ads. So um, if both people decide not to do anything, we have no votes lost or gained because both people do nothing, right? But if this guy is nice and doesn't run any attack ads, but this guy decides to run attack ads, remember what happens, right? He loses 3,000 votes and he gets 1,000 of them, right? On the same, the flip side, if this guy decides to cooperate, but this guy decides to cheat, right? He's going to get 1,000 of the votes and he's going to lose the 3,000 of the votes. If both people run attack ads, okay, remember what happens? They both just lose 2,000 votes apiece. They both just lose 2,000 votes apiece, right? Because uh, 1,000 people vote for the other guy, but then 2,000 people just stop voting altogether. And the other guy, he gets another 1,000, but 2,000 people stop voting altogether. So they just get 2,000 votes altogether. So if you look at this, what is really the best outcome for society? Right here, right? Um, this outcome is the exact same as this as far as for the politicians, right? It doesn't matter if they're no votes lost or Kane or they both lose 2,000 votes equally, right? It doesn't matter because the outcome of the election is going to be the same. But this is a bad outcome from society's viewpoint because there's 4,000 total people that are like fed up with the government. That's a bad outcome for society, right? People are pissed off that we have all these negative campaign ads. Let's real quick find the uh, dominant strategy, shall we, of each of them? Let's pretend that we are R, and we're gonna analyze, and we're gonna look at what this guy does. Okay, so we're R. We have a choice between do not run or run the attack ads. Let's pretend that D is going to not run the attack ads. So I have a choice between no votes lost or gain, or gaining a thousand votes. I'm gonna pick gaining a thousand votes. Let's pretend here I have a choice between losing 3,000 and losing 2,000. I'd rather lose 2,000. I'm always going to pick run at attack ads. This is my dominant strategy. Let's do the same for this guy. Uh, we're going to be, first let's analyze this column. I have a choice between r don't or do run. I can choose no lo votes lost or gain or gaining 1,000 votes. I'm always going to pick this. Okay. Let's do this guy. I can choose between losing 3,000 or losing 2,000. I'm going to pick lose 2,000. I'm always going to run attack ads. My dominant strategy here is run attack ads. His dominant strategy is run attack ads. What's the Nash equilibrium there for? This bad one. Okay. Total prisoner's dilemma. Even though each guy decides promises not to run attack ads, they both are running, running negative campaign ads against the others. And we get to this negative place, right? So this is an example where the prisoner's dilemma is actually bad for society. Right? The Verizon and T-Mobile prisoner's dilemma was good for society. This one is bad for society. Right? So each candidate's dominant strategy is to run attack ads. Therefore, the Nash equilibrium is down there. So why is this, why is this bad? So we know why it's the Nash equilibrium. Right? They both run attack ads. Why is this bad? Well, first of all, does it have changed the election at all? No. Right? It didn't change the election. It just made 2,000 people stop voting on either side, but it didn't change the outcome of the election, right? But it has huge negative impacts on society, right? A lot fewer people are voting. We have all kinds of people that are fed up with voting in the government, right? And so we have less people caring about what the government's doing. It's just bad all around, these negative campaign ads. Total prisoner's dilemma. OK, so I know that I went through pretty much this whole chapter, and we talk about why people don't cooperate, why people normally cheat. But sometimes people cooperate. Why? Well, 
If you repeat the game many times, then you might be able to have cooperation, right? Because you might be like, hey, we're going to play this game today, and then we're going to play the game tomorrow when we sell cell phones, and we're going to play the game the next day when we sell cell phones. If you cheat on me today, I'm going to cheat on you forever. OK? So hey, let's just go ahead and, uh, and cooperate, and we'll just keep cooperating forever. OK? And so there's two strategies that lead to this. Uh, you say, hey, if you cheat on me, if you renege on me, I'm going to cheat for you, I cheat on you, I'm going to renege all, every, every time after that. Okay. In case you're wondering, that's called the grim trigger. You cheat on me once, I'm pulling the trigger. I'm going to cheat on you forever, man. Okay. Then there's also this thing called tit for tat. And this actually works. It's just like this, basically. We're going to meet together in this game every day and sell cell phones every day for forever. Whatever you did last round, I'll do to you. If you cheat on me, I'll cheat on you next time. If you're good on me and you, you agree, then I'll agree. And then that just keeps both people following the agreement, right? Forever, for repeated games. But it, it, you got to have this repeated game action. That's the only way to get cooperation. OK. And uh, let's finally talk about what should the government do for oligopolies? What should the, that's what we call with public policy. Well, Remember that governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. Governments can only improve market outcomes if the market is broken or the market fails. In the case of oligopoly, we have a market failure. The market is broken because we do have some market power. They're able to change the price. Okay? So we know that the production is too low and prices are too high when we compare it to what's best for society. How do I know what's best for society? Easy. I just look at the perfect competition column. Whatever the perfect competition row is, that I know is best for society. So I know that in oligopolies, production is too low and prices are too high. So what can policymakers do? What can the government d can do? Well, they can try to make competition between the oligopolies. They can make it illegal to prevent, to, to uh, collude, which they have done, right? They can make it illegal to collude. Um, and they can try to, and that'll try to move the oligopoly outcome closer to the efficient outcome, which is the perfectly competitive outcome. Right? The whole idea is we want to push uh, quantity out to be near the perfectly competitive quantity. Okay. So uh, antitrust laws. You don't actually have to know these. Just uh, I put them up. I think for under monopoly under the monopoly side, but I'll put them up here again. As a reminder, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 and the Clayton Antitrust Act of 1914, it uh, made it really difficult to collude or to be a monopoly. It, these laws were trying to force people to break up into smaller companies. Why? Well, because we can get to the perfectly competitive outcome if we do that. OK? So those are, I bring these up again. You don't actually have to know exactly these, just know that there's laws on the books that make it hard to be an oligopoly or, or a monopoly. OK, uh, so there, this isn't, there are some controversies. Most people agree that price fixing agreements, remember, that's when one firm calls another firm and says, hey, let's act like a monopoly and have a super high price. Most people think that that should be illegal, right? And it currently is illegal. People have actually gone to jail for that. However, uh, some economists are concerned that policymakers go too far when using antitrust laws to stifle business practices that are not necessarily harmful. Um, so the idea here is that sometimes it's really hard to see when two companies are trying to become an, op a mon uh, an oligopoly versus just trying to be good business people. And here's some examples. Okay. OK, so one of the things that sometimes oligopolists do that, that is Maybe not necessarily bad for competition, but sometimes policymakers look at it and think that this should be illegal. It's called resale price maintenance. Now, what does it do? It's when the manufacturer imposes lower limits on the prices retailers can charge. Have you ever been shopping uh, like on Amazon.com or something like that, and it says like price is too low to show you got to add this item to the cart or something like that? Or sometimes like in, if you get an advertisement for Walmart, it's like, you know, price is too low to show or something like that, right? Well, that, the thing here is that 
That's called resale price maintenance. The company, let's say Hewlett Packard is making a computer and they're selling it through Amazon.com, says to Amazon, you can't sell this product below a certain amount of dollars, right? And so then if Amazon wants to, it has to do these kind of like these legal loopholes. It has to make you add it to the cart or something like that, right? So plenty of times it happens that uh, the, the firms tell the stores that are selling their products, hey, you can't lower the price below a certain amount, right? And so sometimes politicians look at that and they say, uh-oh, that's called the illegal oligopoly thing. They're trying to keep the price high, right? That's called resale price maintenance. So sometimes politicians look at it and think it's illegal. Uh, and it's, it's often opposed because it appears to reduce competition at the retail level. It looks like kind of they're firms that are trying to act like an oligopoly, right? But is it really the firms trying to act like an oligopoly? No, it's just one firm. It's not two firms com communicating together to try to keep the prices for their products high. It's just one firm setting a high price, okay? So it's not really uh, increasing market power because the market power that the manufacturer, the firm has, is at the wholesale level, meaning between factory and store, between factory and Amazon.com. That's where the market power is. The market power is not between store and buyer, okay? So they can't gain from restricting competition at the at the retail level. So at the the retail level is between store and buyer. That's not real that that's not being affected. Okay? So the idea here is that resale price maintenance is actually sh not really two firms trying to be like an oligopoly, function like a monopoly, so it shouldn't it shouldn't really be illegal. And it does have a legitimate objective actually. You know why firms do this? So let's say that you know Hewlett Packard is making that computer or selling on Amazon. They tell Amazon, hey, you can't sell below a certain price. Why is that? Well, it's because what, what we do is we go into Best Buy and we look at the computer and then we go home to Amazon and we buy it for cheaper, right? Well, that's going to put Best Buy out of business if we keep doing that, right? So uh, when Hewlett Packard has this lower level on the price, we call it resale price maintenance, it's actually helping Best Buy stay open, right? And uh, that's called preventing the free rider problem. Remember when you walk in, you just check out the device at Best Buy and then you go buy it on Amazon, that's called free riding. It's a big problem because if everybody did that, Best Buy would close and that would be worse for society because then there's no place to go to check out the computer when you want to see it, right? So we want actually Best Buy to stay open. And so when we do this resale price maintenance, it keeps the online firms from driving the in-person firms, the brick and mortar firms, out of business. Okay? So this actually should not be restricted, even though it kind of looks like maybe firms trying to act like oligopolies that are, that are colluding. Okay, number two, predatory pricing. So sometimes firms do this when Let's say there's one monopoly firm, right? And other firms are going to come join, and they're going to turn it into perfect competition. So the firm doesn't, the monopoly firm doesn't want that. So what does it do? It lowers its price a lot to drive all the other companies out of business. And then when all the other companies are out of business, it raises its price back to the monopoly price. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, this is illegal, and it should be illegal. Because that's not fair. They're trying to push all the other companies out of business, and then they're trying to be a monopoly. And that's bad for society. Okay? It is illegal. But this is really hard. How are you going to sue a firm for having low prices? <laughs> right? Does that work very often? No, because that's what we want. We want the firms to come together to have competition to lower the prices. So how do you know if the firm's lowering its price just because it's responding to competition from the other firms, which is a good thing, or whether it's dropping its price to drive all the other firms out of business, which is a bad thing? It's really impossible to tell, right? Especially for courts and politicians, people who are not economists, to try to figure it out. Nearly impossible to fail, all right? So furthermore, many economists say that, you know what, predatory pricing is is not actually going to work, so probably no one's going to do it. Why? Because it's super risky. 
What do you have to do? You have to lower your price, and that means you're losing money. The, the main firm that's trying to push everybody else is selling at a loss for a little bit. That's super risky, right? And it can backfire. Let's imagine that it lowered its price. It, it, uh, it's losing a bunch of money. It pushes all the other people out. And it's about to go out of business itself. And it's like, OK, we can switch to monopoly profits again. And another firm or another two firms come in, right? Well, then it can't drop. It can't do that predatory pricing thing again because it's already almost about to go out of business, right? So many economists think that predatory pricing might not actually occur as much as we think it might. So like to not, to not worry about it. Okay. Um, and finally, there's this thing called tying when a manufacturer bundles two products together and sells them for one price. So like Microsoft includes a browser with its operating system, right? Microsoft ties two things together. You buy Windows and you get Internet Explorer together. It's called tying. Um, People who are anti-tying says that, well, that's not fair because then like Microsoft can like take over the world, right? And, you know, it gives them more market power. But in the matter, the fact is it really can't change market power. I'm not willing to pay more for two goods together than for the goods separately. So if Internet Explorer is worthless, since the rest of the world buys, uses Google Chrome or Firefox anyway, I'm not willing to pay more for Microsoft Windows with Internet Explorer than I would just be willing to pay for Microsoft Windows. Right? The idea here is if Internet Explorer is worthless to me, I don't care if you bundle a million worthless things with Microsoft Windows, I'm still only paying the price I would be willing to pay for Microsoft Windows alone. So it doesn't actually help the, the companies at all. Right? So tying is not, is not, that, not that big of a deal. Um, the idea is that. Uh, and furthermore, there's actually a good use for tying, which is for price discrimination, um, right? So it's like, oh, if you are a student and you buy Microsoft Windows, it comes with Microsoft Word or something like that, right? And, uh, and so that, that can actually help economic efficiency. OK. All right, so basically, in general, oligopolies it can either seem like a monopoly if they, if they cooperate, or it can seem like competitive markets if they don't cooperate, depending upon the number of firms and how cooperative they are. Right? And the more firms, as that oligopoly goes from two firms to three firms to four firms, it starts looking more like a perfectly competitive system. Right? Uh, we talked about prisoner's dilemma, which shows why people always cheat. They don't cooperate. Okay? And, uh, What's the role of public policy? What should the government do? Well, they can use antitrust laws to try to break up um, oligopolies, but it's sometimes hard to see when firms are acting like a cartel versus when they're just acting as uh, a bunch of perfect competition firms.